If I ask you to picture a village, what do you see? Maybe farms, cattle, quaint houses? And what about a city? Tall skyscrapers? Traffic? Shopping mall? We all implicitly make a distinction between a city and a village. What is urban? What is rural? But my guest today is here to challenge this assumption and reveal the dangers of such an assumption. Hello and welcome to Future Cities Laboratory Podcast. I'm your host, Panvi, and today my guest is Tanya Chandra. Tanya is a PhD researcher in Future Cities Laboratory investigating urban rural systems in the global south, particularly in the Delta region of Bengal in India. Welcome, Tanya. Hi, thank you for inviting me. So, Tanya, I thought I knew what urban means and what rural means. What is wrong with this distinction between urban and rural? And what do you mean by urban-rural system? So, uh, yes, for most of us who live in a city, our first instinct is to imagine urban as this dense, highly mobile metropolitan, whereas in the case of rural, we imagine this quaint, rustic agricultural landscape. Even with these two very distinct and capsulized perspective, urban has gone to be pluralized as a town, city, cosmopolitan, metropolitan, mega city, global city, world city, smart city, and so on. Uh, whereas rural has stayed rural. Uh, and at this juncture, where there is a global push to not only connect physically and technologically, but to be sustainable, it is important to understand urban entities are not a standalone in the region. They don't function in isolation. For example, when we connect two separate urban entities and cut through a region to provide a new type of access to the urban, we are also, by the same access, transforming the negative space between them, which is the rural. And because urban and rural are each other's support system, like the yin and yang of the region, when the role of urban evolves, so does the role of rural, whereby creating a mixture of settlement system. And such a settlement system, which are not easily distinguishable as urban or rural, but function as a system, is an urban-rural system. So if I understand you correctly, there's no clear demarcation between urban and rural, but there exists a whole gradient of settlement types in between. Mm -hmm. Can you give me an example of what these types are and how I can identify them? So from my research in Bengal region in India, uh, four types of settlement patterns are emerging in what are demarcated as rural areas. I classify them as the almost city, the periphery, the in-between zones, and the almost rural. Uh, the almost city comes out from a rural agglomeration where a number of rural jurisdictions have overgrown and agglomerated, usually around two types of accesses, connecting them to a nearby urban agglomeration. The periphery, as we know it, is a transforming rural jurisdiction which is greatly influenced by the construction costs or land use dynamics of a nearby urban jurisdiction. The in-between zone is a direct example of the negative space I just mentioned earlier. It is the in-between two urban bodies usually connected by a single access, uh, mainly road, and hence uh, takes a more linear settlement pattern. Uh, the almost rural is a standalone rural jurisdiction. Uh, this is a one is a bit tricky. It is experiencing in situ transformation, usually because of the accessibility to the rest of the region, uh, to both the hinterland and the urban. The process are slower because it doesn't have a strong urban influence and usually transform due to the internal economic dynamics or the immigration happening from more internal hinterland. So in these types of settlement, people are involved in tertiary as well as primary sectors of economy. It's fascinating how I always thought of settlements as a binary, urban versus rural. And you've identified this plurality of settlements in between. It is an interesting intellectual exploration, but what are the consequences of this type of misrepresentation in real life? So uh, globally, regional planners are experiencing many intended and unintended uh, consequences of the, this binary. Um, because of my research, I will focus on the Indian scenario. So the government of India, in all intents and purposes, planning, governance, uh, 
financial systems are defined along this binary line of urban and rural, which means that there, for example, building bylaws exist in urban areas but does not in a rural areas. The governance systems is an appointed administrative officer from the state and which will have a technical team with it. The rural areas will have locally elected representatives, usually inept in technical knowledge. And financial system, there's a heavy taxation of being in urban areas, whereas in rural areas, the taxes are much low, but Again, the amenities that come with such low taxes are also absent. Though statistically it recognizes, the Indian government recognizes rural jurisdictions to be transforming and urbanizing, but bureaucratically this is a long process and it treats uh, most of these transforming areas as rural entities. Could you tell me long? By long, how much time would it take? Around 20 to 30 years usually. I mean, it depends case by case. 20 to 30, 30 years. Yeah. Wow. So even when it defines urban in multiple tires and has policies and administrative systems to cater to this hierarchy, it does just the opposite for rural jurisdictions, which means all the rural variants I just explained come under a one type of governance system called panchayat. And panchayat is a locally elected representatives uh, who are in charge of planning, developing, maintaining these transforming or not transforming rural areas. Most of them are not technically knowledgeable of these spatial processes. Um, besides the technical ineptness in the governance system of these areas, there is a conflict of interest for the locally elected representative because A, as soon as they uh, say that this area is urban and they start doing the declaration process, there would be administrative processes coming in which will remove them from a place of power in the community. And the second is as soon as the taxation rises, the money holders, so the businesses, they start having a problem because they are now paying urban taxes compared to the rural taxes that they would have, uh, they pay. Um, which means that both the power and the money in this area, people who hold the power and money, they are against being urban. But they also would get infrastructure, urban infrastructure. I mean, what I have experienced now, one cannot say for everyone, but uh, all the cases, but what I experienced in those 61 uh, governance agency is that usually their houses are always in a very well-located area. They are not experiencing that kind of vulnerability that the most low-income families are facing or, or single-parent families are facing. And what about the common people? So I understand from your answer that people who have power or money would like to resist this kind of yeah. change. And what about the common people? Now, common people, usually it depends on the kind of role that they're playing. But if they are more organized, they are more inclined to be working in tertiary sectors than in primary sectors. They prefer to be urban because that means commuting to their work becomes easier. They are getting water every time of the day or at least, you know, at a given time. Or they are having electricity, their sanitation is taken care of, the garbage is taken care of. Uh, they have street lighting so they, their kids can go out and play or study, take tuitions. You know, tuitions are very important in India. So <laughs> they can obviously do all those things. So they are more inclined. But... As soon as if the household is more economically dependent on agriculture, they have a different sense because they are like, well, but I will be taxed and my la I have a huge land which will be taxed as an urban land, which I don't want to do. And that's where the policy comes in because it's made such a one block rural. It doesn't look at land properties differently in rural areas, right? Mm -hmm. Though it is taxing a bit here and there, but as soon as it, if the area comes under, even agricultural land would be taxed differently. So these are the things that, of course, more agriculture science, more policy science have to look at. But what I would look at is more the spatial markers to understand the transforming processes that you know, create these regions to not be rural. It's really interesting how a simple classification that's based on some arbitrary set of rules that the government decided, and then they did a mapping ex exercise to define them, and it has such far-reaching consequences. And clearly we need a more nuanced understanding of how these settlements are developing, and that's exactly what you're doing in Bengal in India. I know that you recently completed a field visit in Bengal where you conducted interviews with 61 local governance agencies and almost 400 households. Mm. Can you tell us more about this visit and why you chose to use this method 
how did you structure interviews and how did you conduct these? Uh, uh, so these areas are mostly unknown. They are looked in most research studies from a perspective of agriculture and agriculture production. So to say that they are becoming urban or they are urbanizing, a whole set of data points had to be created, which means I had to take this huge statistical way of studying an area. But at the same time, I don't know what the processes are. I cannot predict, I cannot make a survey and say, okay, I'm going to do a statistical regression on uh, how many houses were constructed. Because I don't know how many houses or what kind of houses are constructed and would you counter them as just being a part of the transforming area or actually that the urbanization processes are coming in. So I started with first the pilot study and uh, to understand the macro data that I was looking at. Okay, so there are these densities in this area, there are these kind of sort of constellation of urban entities and rural areas that are emerging in Bengal and I can, pre uh, I can select four sites. And from that, I started going to the site and do a pilot study. When I started the pilot study, I understood the conflicts that are there between the power and the money and this local representatives and the local communities. And at that point, I said, okay, if I do want to make a statistical strong data point from my research and say that these areas have these trends and that's why policies have to be tailored to this way, then I do need that statistic data. But at the same time, I do not want to encapsulate them and say that this is A, B, C means this transformation, C, D. So I really wanted to learn from, from the site. And I, I left the survey to be unstructured, which means that many, of the, many times I asked them what was the physical process of, for example, making a house? How do they go about uh, getting the permission, getting the material, getting the labor, getting the technical experts, uh, actual construction and the design of it? And what taxes do they have to pay now, now that the house has become from a traditional mud and thatch house to a contemporary brick and mortar house? And at that point, by tracing all these physical processes, they are never giving an opinion. They are t really telling, I did this and I did that, which means that they are taking me through their processes. And in that way, in telling a story in a statistical way, I can understand what was the behind political and the financial sort of pulls and push in this area without really diving them in and creating a situation where they feel they are obligated to either answer wrongly just to get rid of the question or that they feel that they cannot answer something and they just reject the survey altogether. So you, you really ask people how they are changing their houses physically, renovating the houses and kind of able to diagnose the larger processes that are driving uh, mm -hmm. this urbanization process. Can I ask you, did you grow up yourself in an urban area or a rural area? No, I'm totally an urban child. Uh, I've always been in an urban areas, and I thought of rural as being this rustic uh, place, you know, and going to learn pottery when I visit my grandparents and all, thinking it's it's not changing more than agriculture and pottery. So you do have a um, sort of urban gaze. I think yeah. as an urban and a woman, you have certain preconceived notions and biases. When you conduct these unstructured interviews, how do you check these biases? Uh, many a times you have to just sit and listen and I think that's uh, most researchers in Global South have to take a sort of a subdued stance, a sort of a backdrop stance to let them tell the story, of course, but at the same time it, it is asking them also oh, what did you do now and then what did you do this because they forget and they, they are telling a story from their perspective, you know, they minded a certain aspect and they won't tell something else. So it had to be structured, but at the same time, taking a step back. Uh, so that was the main thing in terms of methods, but at, in terms of checking my biases, my personal biases, I, I thought that the area where I was visiting won't be very educated, I won't get right answers, it would be difficult to travel, uh, uh, especially as a woman. Um, and yes, there were challenges in between these uh, kind of completely taking that as a dark zone to uh, saying that yes, it was super easy, no. But it was in between that I couldn't travel after sundown, for example, being a woman. 
and most of the people will return from work after dark so i had to find a way in between and at the same time it was still easy i was doing most of my traveling by myself i did not need like a a companion or someone to sort of be my god kind of a thing and at the same time they were very educated most uh, people my age had done their bachelors and people much older had at least finished their high schools they knew of this sort of political nuances they had uh, these ideas they knew the policies they knew what what they can and cannot do and they would work around it uh, as they say in global yeah, south it's so interesting the, that brings me to my final question how do you think policy making will or should change uh, for urban rural systems in the future should we have more tailored custom policy making for this gradient between the urban and the rural or do you imagine that the urban will completely swallow up the rural in the future no that's very difficult to predict and i think most most uh, planners or statistical people working in regional planning are trying to find if urban can swallow the <laughs> rural uh, but it's very difficult to predict a because since 23 years um, these areas are transforming however the urban hasn't really swallowed it whole um, but at the same time it's just been 30 to 20 to 30 years in given spans of how civilization developed this is quite short um, so i won't say that i would predict if the urban for uh, uh, you know completely swallows the rural but i would say that at this juncture at this point what we can do as policy makers as researchers is to understand the plural form of rural and to identify spatial markers to sort of inform policy making uh, what i mean by that is that many of the times for urban areas we have if the urban area is a town it gets this kind of administration if the urban area is this it gets this kind of policy and same goes for rural you can identify spatial markers of the transformation and see especially things that trigger like road development housing policies uh, um even educational institution construction if they are triggering these things in your region you identify them as a spatial marker and start planning your policy according to this kind of tire system even in rural areas yeah that was a great discussion thank you vanya thanks for enlightening us on the urban and the rural systems thank you